Hello everyone, Jonathan back once more with a not so mystery weapon for you. It is of course a Lewis light machine gun, Mark I. It is quite an early example, quite, quite a nice piece in itself, but the reason we've got it here today is, well, you've probably seen what it is, even if you're not following along over on social media and taking a guess. What we have attached to this on the side here that I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate for you in a moment is a fairly hilarious piece of interwar British military equipment. Uh, and it's called the Rattle, comma, Lewis, comma, 303 inch machine gun Mark I. Now, if I'm interpreting my backwards British nomenclature correctly, it's the Mark I Rattle for the Lewis 303 inch machine gun. Um, I hope I've got that right. But the, the, the idea of there being more than a Mark I of this is, is pretty mind boggling. Uh, we'll come in and show you the only marking on this, which is the Enfield monogram, which is worth knowing if you ever look at rifles or any other bits from Enfield, and you see a D with a tick in the middle of it, that's actually the E, the F, and the D of Enfield, which is already a short form of Enfield, but you know what I mean. You'll see the E, F, D on other, in, um, as another form of the marking. And this one's dated 1926. Uh, we do actually have a sealed pattern of this thing, and it's introduced a little bit before that. So completely official device. Why am I getting so excited about it? Well, uh, it, it's just how Dad's Army this is. Now, without further ado, let me show you how it works. So a little bit awkward from this angle, but very simply, we don't worry about any of the working parts back here. We grab this handle and we turn it. And that gives you hopefully an idea of what this thing is, how it works, and how well it actually does that job, because that's pretty loud. Yes, you've guessed it, this is in fact a one-up from shouting bang as you run around with, in this case, your Lewis gun. Now we've heard a number of stories over the years from different armed forces in different countries that when ammunition is in short supply, um, or they're just trying to save some money, the interwar period in the UK being a case in point, they will have soldiers shout bang rather than firing off real blank ammunition. Um, there's also a question of blank ad uh, adaptation. Um, if you, you don't have the ready means to fit a blank adapter to your gun, another way to make a realistically loud noise so that everyone knows roughly what's going on in your training exercise is to fit one of these. Now, for those of you in the UK, possibly elsewhere, you're probably thinking football rattle. And that's very clearly where this comes from. Um, although there were also rattles for other purposes, like uh, the police. We actually have one in the collection. The collection does veer a little bit into sort of law, law enforcement uh, bits of kit. Truncheons, notably, they are, they are a form of weapon. Uh, police helmets, of course, are a form of armour. And so we have the odd set of handcuffs and rattle. So a Victorian policeman might be running down the street swinging a rattle around to make a loud noise. Very used to be very common at football matches to see people swinging rattles around. Um, not something I've seen for, for some time. So that same basic technology, which is a metal cog, essentially, and then a rigid, um, another rigid piece of metal, and they are twanging, the, the cog is essentially twanging the, <laughs> the plate. Very simple. And then metal block, sorry, a wooden block to mount it to, steel straps and a wing nut on this side to clamp it onto the barrel jacket over the radiator that's over the barrel of this Lewis gun. So as, as much as I'm mocking this thing, um, there, there, there were probably practical reasons for it being introduced. The reason I don't think we've seen or heard much about this from, from veterans or from history books or, or uh, so forth is it's introduced in the mid-1920s when war is hopefully a distant memory, sadly that turns out not to be the case, when money is extremely tight and by the time we might have seen this the Second World War has kicked off and we are already tooling, uh, tooling up and issuing the bread. And we are very much committed to buying blank ammunition and, and using blank ammunition or even live ammunition in the right circumstances in training. So this, is, this was probably a rare sight. It was officially adopted. It would have been officially used. 
I've yet to see any photos or video of it in use. If you've seen any of that, please do let us know in the comments and we will make a note of that. So this is the star of this particular show, but I can't not mention a couple of other features of this Lewis because sometimes in this collection, there's more than one thing going on. So it's a relatively early uh, BSA made um, Mark I Lewis gun, as mentioned. It has the, the Belgian markings that remind you <laughs> who invented this. Um, we'll show you the markings on there. It's never been out on service, I think we can safely say. It doesn't have the Mark I Star mod with the oil bottle in the butt there. There are probably other features that um, other machine gun knowledgeable people would, have, would pick up on. But this bipod is another unusual feature. Now, unlike the rattle, I am not 100% sure on whether this was ever adopted. The, the sources we have available to us, uh, readily at least, um, don't include it. It's perfectly possible that it was. We know that it was patented by BSA, the same people who made the guns. Um, you, incidentally, you've seen the Lewis gun and heard of BSA on the TV series Peaky Blinders. They, they did uh, a reasonable job there with the, the firearms history and how that related to uh, at least the war, maybe less so the running around the streets with, with uh, Lewis guns, but nonetheless. This is not something you'll see on a standard Lewis gun either. It's quite heavy. Uh, now, it's deceptive picking this up because this drum is, oh, this pan or pannier is loaded with um, drill rounds, which adds a lot, to, a lot of weight. The rattle adds a lot of weight. But this thing is, is a hefty piece of blued steel as well. So the, in, the innovations here are a pair of handles that you can pull together and carry the gun, one hand, probably on the butt, on the wrist of the butt there, and then grab these handles. Um, I guess you could also grab them separately and hoik the front of the gun around to position it. In theory, this is meant to be a two-man team gun. Seems a little superfluous to me as someone who's never had to use one of these in anger. The handles are also a means of adjusting the legs, and they are very much like the Maximal Vickers tripod in that respect. There's a, um, a series of teeth on each, on, on the, the face of the leg and on the face of the mount that interface together in a clamped shut for stability, and then you undo them to allow you to then move the bipod leg back and forth. So I could, if I wanted to, for some reason, position it there, and then do up the, the handle. Obviously, we don't want to do that. You could fold them up, were it not for the comedy football rattle strapped to the side of the gun. Uh, for now, I'll just cinch that back up so it doesn't collapse. So an unusual and excessively hefty and excessively expensive bipod design, I would suggest. Um, it also pivots. This is partly why it's so heavy and complicated. So it pivots left and right to allow you to traverse the gun without a normal sort of doctrine, I suppose, with uh, machine guns with bipods, or well, especially machine guns, light machine guns with bipods, is you lift the gun up to let the, the tripod sit correctly and drop it back down. So you're not forcing the gun onto target and messing up your accuracy. Because you do want accuracy with machine gun. Uh, with the spikes on the feet there to have it bedded in, potentially even sandbagged in, if you're trying to give more sort of sustained fire for whatever reason, and you swing the gun back and forth within, a, within an arc. So it's an interesting sort of tactically flexible design, but heavy, expensive. If indeed it wasn't adopted, as I suspect it wasn't, you can sort of see why. And the final feature is one that we can't really show you, except for a marking on the back here, and that's that this is chambered in 303 rimless. Now, something I see quite a bit online, uh, a lot of chat about the rimmed 303 cartridge and what a nightmare that must have been, and it was a complete disaster, and why on earth didn't we move to a rimless cartridge? Well, there are various good reasons why not, articulated by um, people better qualified to me to than me to comment. We won't go into that argument, but Suffice to say that in the margins, they were absolutely looking at a rimless cartridge, both uh, you know, replacing the 303 caliber entirely and at least two attempts to uh, make or keep the 303 projectile and redesign the case to make it rimless. Although I gather in this case, the 303 rimless we're talking about around about 1917 was actually semi rimless. 
So for more on that, you can head over to British Military Small Arms Ammunition, uh, which is a Google site page set up by the late Tony Edwards, who is very, very knowledgeable on ammunition. And it's really quite nicely set out. You can page on the left-hand side through the different types of ammo and 303 rimless. Um, it's quite a long write-up in there. Um, at one point, the uh, RAF, or RFC at that time, were going to convert over all their Lewis guns, in theory, to 303 rimless. Um, and we would have adopted the pattern 14, which, which we did, but in 303 rimless, not in 303 standard, 303 British as it's often called today. So an absolutely standard gun fitted with, or with three different interesting things about it, one of which you could not possibly have guessed, two of which you might have. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Um, there are various ways that you can engage with the collection here at the Royal Armouries, this being one of them. Um, you can also head over to the GameSpot YouTube channel for more of me talking about guns. Um, we have our own social media outlets, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, there's our website, of course, our online collection that you can peruse. Uh, most of all, though, we'd very much like you to come and visit us at one of our three sites here in the UK, up here at Leeds, uh, down at Fort Nelson on the south coast, or indeed at the famous Tower of London, where all of the arms and armour you can see there are ours, which is nice. <laughs> so we'll see you again next time.